All right, welcome back. It's still The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Away from off the press, uh, our first uh, discussion for this morning is insecurity, specifically terrorism financing. It is disheartening when we hear stories in the uh, newspapers all over that uh, 18 billion naira is actually moved uh, within the nation's uh, financial system annually, you know, for the Islamic State of West African province. Uh, it is disturbing. How did they get their financing? How could they pass through, you know, our financial system um, undetected. Uh, so basically, that's what we'll be talking about at this particular segment. And we have a, you know, former assistant director of the, the Department for State Services, uh, Dennis Amakri, joining us on this this course. Uh, good morning to you, Dennis Amakri. Good morning. All right, many thanks for joining us on uh, this particular discourse. You know, sometimes uh, it is really disheartening when you think that uh, we have a financial system and that, uh, that's supposed to be, you know, a very formal system. How is it possible that uh, terrorism could actually be financed, you know, when Nigeria is actually at its peak of, uh, you know, the war uh, against insurgency and 18 billion naira is actually moved within the nation's um, system annually undetected? Uh, well, um, yes, you have a good good morning and thanks for having me here. Um, the, the system is formal, but this particular set of monies are being moved in the informal sector because we have an illicit criminal economy that exists, you know, and it is very, very vibrant, whereby you know, a lot of uh, different kinds of bodies are moved in and out, either for terrorism, financing, or for buying of arms, all part of the same uh, violent uh, criminal economy. Okay, so um, I remember vividly that the Attorney General of the Federation sometime in May had announced that the Nigerian government uh, was very, I mean, was, had started the prosecution of 400 suspected Boko Haram financiers and was profiling, you know, some persons. So the question now for me is, do you think that we're winning the, the fight against insurgency? I mean, looking at the fact that, you know, the, uh, the president came through and he said security is a major concern for him and uh, how many more years to go? What are your thoughts? Juxtaposing that with the fact that uh, these funds, we know how vital and important, uh, you know, funds are for every institution. Yeah, now um, let's go back a little bit in history or in the recent past. Then we'll find out that um, actually um, all these monies, when Boko Haram started, they don't have any money. They don't even have guns. But um, in 2002, it was very significant that Osama bin Laden, you know, heard about Boko Haram and actually came around and gave about three million dollars you know where they started buying guns and then as they started buying guns they had this affiliation and they were being taught on how to raise money because there is no way you can continue um, uh, running a terrorist organization without raising money and then they now ended up that's where we started hearing about kidnapping um, uh, all kinds of uh, bank robbery, uh, uh, drug drug smuggling, you know, even protection money. Some governors in the north were paying protection money to these guys so that they will not be attacked. And they were paid in the millions. You know, so I am not surprised right now that it has risen up to 18 billion because that economy is actually booming. And then, of course, with all the things that are going on, even in Lake Chad area, the Boko Haram people control the fish market, the fish market from Lake Chad, you know. So these are all different forms of how they raise their money. And then, of course, we were not very serious about uh, prosecuting them. How many have they prosecuted? So that if you read the newspapers, you don't even see you know, where people are prosecuted, um, how they have gone to jail. Um, the ones that they caught in Dubai, we are still talking about it. I guess we need to get those people in jail so that others will learn lessons. But um, 
uh, we are so slow about it that uh, it encourages them to continue. Kidnapping is a big business in Nigeria right now. And this is what is going on. We have to start looking at these things very, very critically because uh, Nigeria is a member uh, of all those uh, international uh, anti money laundering uh, or, you know, uh, 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 groups. And then we should, of course, make our membership very effective. All right, uh, Dennis, uh, the ECOWAS body that came out uh, with this particular report uh, said, let me just quote them, that the, Niger uh, the government lacked adequate insights into Boko Haram and ISWAP international linkages and abuse of the former financial and commercial sectors. Do you agree with that postulation? Yes, I think um, we are not looking at it and there is no way we are busy trying to either, you know, uh, get it right with the informal sector. Forget about terrorism. Let's think about ourselves right now. You know, when you look at the banking sector, it is all those big companies and uh, big people or salaried people that are working and getting loans and, you know, in fact, you know, you know remember what they said, uh, we are going cashless society? Cashless society. Now, the cashless society, they try to put things in place whereby you use cash, you don't change cash and all the rest. But we are still using cash. Nigeria is largely a cash society. The market woman selling tomato and all those kind of those people don't use ATMs. They don't use POS, you know? So it's cash-based. And most of these things, uh, ransom payment for kidnapping, is cash. You know, it doesn't go through the formal system. So the, the, the government does not have a very good idea about how much money is being moved around in that particular platform. Okay, putting, putting it differently right now, um, Dennis, uh, 18 billion naira is actually a whopping sum. And you had um, uh, historically talked about um, how um, you know, uh, Boko Haram got the attention of um, Osama bin Laden. But if they are transacting or maybe doing um, some sort of financial uh, transactions uh, in the country, is it like uh, they have businesses here that have formed the operations or just how exactly do they get to move 18 billion naira across Nigeria annually? Okay, um, <laughs> you know, it is not a situation where you collect the money up to when it is 18 million, you move it around, okay? Uh -huh. This is the total sum of what is available in that economy. That criminal economy, you know, the volume of business going on is 18 billion. That's what the report is saying. And then when you look at it, it's bigger than the annual uh, listing of many countries, you know. So um, it's a very large sum of money. What happens is that people are using it. What, like I said, in that informal business, informal platform, this is the volume that is moving around. All right, understood, uh, Dennis. Okay, um, Dennis Amakri, let's also talk about the fact that, you know, the government as a way of fighting, because, I mean, we're still very big on the BVN and the NIN, uh, you know, SIM linkage. Do you think that that's, uh, that's been very effective with the fight against uh, insurgency? Um, well, the BVN is still tied to the formal sector, you know? The NIM and the BVS are all tied to the former sector. And they have not been very effective in the sense that, you know, um, I know if you drop a, a lump sum into the any bank, it will be reported to Central Bank. And Central Bank is supposed to investigate to find out where this money is coming from. Uh, but I don't know how good they do that. I cannot really tell because I don't know I've not heard of anybody that has been confronted uh, with the life of money. Uh -huh. So these are the kind of things. I really, I, I can, to answer your question, I'll tell you that I, I, I don't think uh, it has been very, very effective. 
Okay, but we also had a case where uh, Kuda Bank uh, reported, you know, a person who actually dropped uh, 800,000 naira or thereabout. Now, you, you've also mentioned uh, the case of that the government have not been able to prosecute their slow to action. And also, uh, that's not far from the truth because the government themselves had said, I remember that this statement was made all the way in New York, that they had identified those who were sponsoring and, you know, funding this terrorist group. And as such, they will be prosecuted. So the question is, um, do you have an idea why they haven't been prosecuted? Uh, well, we have a very slow justice uh, system. The criminal justice system is uh, very, very slow in Nigeria because we don't give priority to some cases, even when they are high profile cases. Uh, you remember Evans, the kidnapper. Mm. His case, it was just our last week when he was uh, sentenced to death. And uh, after how many years, you know, so uh, we are not very, very uh, fast when it comes to dealing with this. Because when you don't uh, do justice and let it be seen to be done, you know, then people will take it for granted. Uh, many states have uh, even declared kidnapping as uh, they've uh, said uh, they passed the law saying it's death sentence if, if you are caught kidnapping. But how many people have been caught and how many people have been sentenced to death? We are not yet. Uh, we've not heard anything about that. So I think that's where we are. So the case that we, we have right now, would you say that is the fact that, you know, the financial institution in Nigeria is not, uh, there are loopholes. I mean, there's a lacuna or they're not properly structured. Or it could be that the federal government in itself uh, is not willing, you know, to prosecute arrest and uh, deal with these persons who are sponsoring and funding this uh, group of persons. Well, uh, when you talk about the financial system, whether it has loopholes, I think it does. It does. Uh, it is something that uh, could be overcome, but uh, I don't think that we are actually serious in pursuing it. We are not very serious in pursuing it because um, there are loopholes. The informal sector, especially, is, is there. A lot of money moves around. And um, we are not being able to gather it into a system where it can be monitored. And I think that is the biggest problem we are having. So all these terrorists can, you know, use their kite and move them around. In fact, uh, change it into dollars and then, of course, move it around. So these are the things that uh, are happening. Uh, we should be able to diligently, diligently make sure that we spread the net in such a way that most of the monies that are moving in the informal sector come back into the system whereby central bank or even the EFCC can be monitoring and then knowing that this is what is going on. All right, and Dennis, uh, you know, the um, global anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing standards stipulates that, uh, you know, this asset of, uh, you know, terrorists should be confiscated. But this report that came out uh, just uh, barely 24 hours ago, exactly indicting the federal government of not confiscating the assets of these terrorists. Yes, there is also some problems we have. You know, Nigeria is a member of the Financial Action uh, uh, Tax Force, uh, international body under the United Nations, I think, and uh, we've not been able to ratify ourselves very well. We've been on that list of countries that are non compliant, you know, countries that are non compliant. Now, um, why do we keep on um, not meeting up to this? And I don't want to call it a Nigerian factor because normally I know whenever anything happens in Nigeria, there is this factor of man no man or long leg or whatever, you know, and even the terrorists, some of them that have been arrested, some cannot even be prosecuted because you find out people begging for them or some other people making political statements about them and stuff like that. So those, those situations where we are not, you know, following up on certain things, I think is the factor that is pulling us back, where there is a lukewarm attitude or like a attitude in certain things 
that we are not following up according to global standards. All right, can, can you take us through, because uh, in the course of our conversation, you have constantly mentioned the informal sector, where you think that these elements are actually, uh, you know, pushing this fund through. What could, which, uh, what informal sector are we talking about now? Uh, the informal sector of uh, cash-based transactions. Cash-based transactions. I'll give you an example. Now, right now, uh, Boko Haram controls, or ISWAP controls the fish market, the smoked fish market in Lichard, you know, and the red pepper market. Now, they don't send their money to the bank. They sell and they give them cash. There are people um, that are actually buying and selling, and of course, the taxes. That's another way of uh, financing their, their, their activities. They tax people. And these taxes are being paid to them. And this is not paid through the banks. These are paid cash. And as they collect the money physically, they gather it up together, either change it into dollars or use it to buy, uh, they will go around and maybe buy food, buy food, and there are people who sell them food. You know, and these people will collect the money in cash and give them food, which they use in going to uh, do their own thing. But what I am really worried about is those areas where they go out and buy uh, tankers, uh, uh, guns. When you look at uh, AK-47, one single AK-47 is about 400,000 naira. One. One. So, but they are buying it internationally from manufacturers and stuff like that. Yes, there is uh, the, uh, the dark market where people on the ground, they can go and buy whatever they want to buy, you know. Uh, and then, of course, business is done in hush-hush. But security agencies have also come to monitor that very particular uh, environment where they know, you know, even with drugs, where certain movements are being made and uh, of course if we use technology very well uh, all these movements can be monitored it can be monitored either the movement of arms and ammunition or drugs or illegal money all that can be monitored but you have to go down to the dark to the dark cloud to do that all right, uh, uh, Dennis, I still think uh, we should talk about um, the role of the DSS in all of this. I don't know how effective they have been with their intelligence when it comes to terrorism financing. Uh, critically, you know, there's, there's so much movement when it comes to uh, small arms and um, weapons in Nigeria. How do we begin to monitor this, ensure a bit of control and sanity so that, uh, you know, when these arms are bought or if they should even be bought, you know, would know what channel, where they are coming from, and who can be nabbed, and all of that. Uh, yes, um, the DSS itself, you know, I think uh, are doing very well because uh, most of these things that are becoming uh, coming to light now, you know, are intelligence that have been gathered so far, you know. So uh, they are doing their own, but I I think that they could do more. They could do more. And if they could do more, it is the government that will sponsor them. I don't want to a situation where we, you know, like Aduna State was doing when they were paying ransom instead of giving it to the security people. And now they decided not to pay the ransom, but the money, are you giving it to the security people to use? Because they can use that to increase their capacity. Mm. All right, so uh, we, we have, um, you know, just how many more days and, uh, to end uh, this administration. Uh, what would you think that the government, of course, security is a major concern for them. What can this government do to remedy the fight against insurgency and, of course, uh, the fight against terrorists in Nigeria? I, I think the president has said it, that he's not going to leave the office in disgrace and is not going to leave it you know just as it is now that means he's going to do something about it you know and i, I want to give you the benefit of the doubt that you actually go ahead and do something about it 
because uh, we are the security sector when the uh, first came into power it was one of the pillars on which he came to power and then he has said it and uh, of course they've done a lot because if they've not done a lot i can tell you one thing Boko Haram should have overrun this country okay uh, that is a reality uh -huh. although we've not been able to decimate them but a lot have been done but i would want more to be done by either recruitment recruit more security people police because the police is too thin you know we cannot continue having a uh, 400 policemen policing more than 200 million people you know so let's go ahead and have uh, the police recruit more people equip them look at their uh, you know their welfare same thing with the security agencies the DSS, because we need more, more human intelligence. And if you need more human intelligence, that means you have to send it, you have to send it more human, more people into the field to gather that information or intelligence for you. You know, so even the military, because when you talk about the whole security setup in Nigeria, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Police, EFCC, whoever, DSS, and IA, they are not up to two million. The security system, you know, is not up to two million. And we are prosecuting a war. And if we are going to prosecute this war effectively, uh, they can even go ahead and conscript people if they have to do it. But again, I think though, I don't think that is even the problem. I think it's the money, because if you don't give out the enough money to recruit people and which will take care of their salary, uniforms, arms, and everything, then you are, you are not serious. So I think, I think the politicians should uh, wake up and take care of this situation, because in 2023 is coming, and instead of looking at this security problem and making sure that it is out of the way they are busy campaigning telling you who is going to be next president telling you uh, who is going to be next chairman and all those kind of things as if as if they are not in this country uh, it is something a patriotic call for people to first secure this country then we can talk about their political systems all right, uh, uh, Dennis uh, Macri, uh, let's talk about uh, some, you know, policies that have been put in place in Nigeria. Specifically, uh, sometime in July, that's four months ago, uh, the central bank came out with a policy, you know, uh, and uh, limited or banned, you know, the... You know the CB, uh, the BDCs, that's Bureau de Change um, operators. You know from transacting, you know sale yeah. of um, forex, uh, because we find that that sometimes uh, we've heard in reports that uh, these uh, they get their their forex and financing from that particular you know parallel market. No, but over time now it's been four months. You really think uh, that has actually helped? Uh, it has actually reduced uh, maybe the financing um, of these um, terrorists. Uh, yes, of course, that is part of the informal sector that we're talking about. That is a part of the informal sector because, uh, he, you know, the terrorists will go ahead and uh, gather some Naira, uh, kidnap somebody, uh, 100 million, and all those kind of things, 10 million. And this money, they don't carry it around like that. They go to the Bureau de Change. And the Bureau de Change people, that's why you find out that the last food that were caught, caught most of them were bureau de change people, you know. And uh, uh, the parallel market is well and alive. And until CBN go ahead and marry these two together, whereby you can actually go out and buy from that parallel market at the CBN rate, uh, and then uh, they, they, they do your business. Because when they do that, it gives them the opportunity to monitor who is buying or who is selling. But if you allow the uh, parallel market to be running on its own, then what do you expect? They will buy dollars because even the 
Central Bank come out to say that uh, these people should go ahead and uh, uh, lose source for their dollars. If they are sourcing for their dollars, they can source it anywhere, anywhere. And when they source it anywhere, you are out of control of that dollar that they are sourcing. It's simple, it's simple logic. So I, I think um, the CBA will have to look at this if they are very, very serious because that market is very large, I can tell you, very, very large. All right. Uh, another issue right now would be uh, kidnapping uh, for ransom, uh, banditry and terrorism, because uh, from all that you have said, uh, they, uh, this uh, bandits, this terrorist, this um, ASWAB, the Boko Haram, they have too much money in their hands. That's why they could go as much as, uh, you know, dealing with um, the BDCs. So basically, it just goes to the fact that uh, the nation has not been able to tackle this issue of, uh, you know, kidnapping for ransom. What are your thoughts, yeah. really? Yeah, we've not been able to tackle it properly because we've not been able to follow it systematically. You know, we are still doing it in the fire brigade way. Uh, let's go through this. Somebody is kidnapped. What do you do? You go and report to the security agencies or the police. You know, and then they call you. They call you and they say, they don't call the police. Uh, bring uh, such and such an amount. And then, of course, um you don't have a quick response team i don't think the irt of the police have done very well they busted so many kidnap cases even the army even the sss uh, so now they do that but they are not enough they are not enough the number of people that are being kidnapped on a daily basis is more than can be handled by the irt so what do you do follow it systematically because kidnapping is a low risk low risk adventure but high yield you know high yield uh, uh, profitably so you find out that uh, to, to kidnap somebody is very very easy but the way you get the money the money is a lot of money so it is very, very easy. And Nigeria is, funny enough, we've had situations where even the uh, uh, children are arranging themselves to be kidnapped so that their father can give them money uh, to do whatever things they want to do. We've had cases where a girl arranged with her boyfriend to be kidnapped so that uh, he, uh, he, their father will bring money for the boyfriend to go overseas. You know, so all kinds of things do happen. But if you are following it systematically, and when I say systematically, I'm talking about ransom payments. Ransom payments. You don't give money to them to just take away. You should be able to follow the money. Follow that money by tracking it. You know, make sure that it's not easy for them to just collect it and then go and spend it or send it to Islam. You know? Because that money, because look at it, when they kidnap people and sometimes when the military go and bust their camps, they just collected about 50 million. But you don't see a cobo in that camp. What does that tell you? It tells you that that money has been transmitted to somewhere else. You know, and it is moving around in this country. We have checkpoints all over the place. They are not seeing this money. Or maybe they are seeing it that they are being compromised to allow it to pass, you know. So these are these are fundamental issues that are bedeviling our system. And um, I hope uh, we will have a rethink by actually sitting down and look at holistically look at our problem because uh, you cannot uh, solve one and then uh, the rest will be solved at the same time. Discuss. You have also mentioned the fact that you know the personnel is is a major concern for the fight against insurgents in Nigeria. Looking at the entire force, not uh, you know making up to I mean meeting up the two million figure like you mentioned. 
But some other, um, you know, persons would say that religion is a major, you know, concern against the fight against insurgency. Uh, because of some religious affiliation and what have you, uh, that's also uh, a big problem. And others are also saying that the issue of corruption, because um, whether or not we want to agree, uh, you also look at the budget year in, year out. You find out that uh, the military and defense would always take a huge chunk of the budget. And some people say the corruption that is going on in the military is also affecting the fight against uh, insurgency. I, I'd, I'd like to share your thoughts on it. Do you agree with these persons who are putting out this uh, opinion? Yeah, yes. Um, the thing is that uh, it's not actually even religion anymore. In the beginning of Boko Haram, when Boko Haram started, it was religion. But right now, it's no more religion because Boko Haram kills Christians, they kill Muslims, you know, they raid mosques, they raid churches. So it is no more religion. But corruption, yes, you know, we have a very corrupt system and uh, we know it. And that's why, you know, when you really bring it down to the street level, whereby uh, people don't want to obey street lights, you know, and you do certain things and they say, oh no, it is Nigeria style. Oh, this is Nigeria. Somebody said that to me about two days ago and I was really, really angry with the person. You know, this is Nigeria. I said, what do you mean by this is Nigeria? You know, so you can't do the right thing because you feel that this is Nigeria. So this is the problem we are having. Corruption, yes, it has eaten deep into our system. And it lives with us right now because it has permeated everywhere where people feel that you cannot even get anything done properly if you don't tip somebody or something like that. You know, or you can commit a crime and then a policeman arrests you and then of course you 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 give him some money and they let you go. You can't do those kind of things in some countries. You try and bribe a policeman in the United States, you are in for it. You know, so these are the problems we have, and they are fundamental. All right. All right, we must say a very big um, thank you to you, uh, Dennis Macri, former assistant director of the DSS. Thanks for sharing your thought on this particular discourse. We do appreciate your time. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. All right, it is still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. We'll take a quick break and when we return, we'll have guests joining us to tackle uh, the issue of bullying in our schools in a moment. Uh, do join us again. <laughs>